All right, this is William Newsom with episode one of the Christendom Curriculum Podcast. Our question today is this, is Narnia multicultural? Ever thought about that? We're going to talk about it today. As you may know, both C.S. Lewis and his Chronicles of Narnia have endured charges of racism throughout the years. But then, who hasn't, right? When the big screen version of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe came out in 2005, The Guardian published an article, Narnia represents everything that is most hateful about religion. That's just one example. When even great men like C.S. Lewis can be accused of racism, no one is safe from the charge. And among those Narnia fans who think that racist is the worst thing that can be said of a man, well, I suppose it's understandable that they would want to defend Lewis from those charges. And what better way to do so than by saying, hey, Lewis can't be racist. Narnia was a multicultural society, after all. And there is a superficial plausibility to the claim. After all, Narnia was a nation that included humans, talking animals, fauns, centaurs, dwarfs, and the like. Very different peoples, but all Narnian. The question is this, is Narnia actually multicultural? And the answer, no, it is not. Narnia was more like Israel in the Bible, a commonwealth or republic made up of various tribes. Very different peoples, different nations, one might say, but certainly all united in a single Narnian identity. Yet there was also a real separation, or at least distinction, between those various peoples. And that, as we shall see, is enough to establish that Narnia is not a multicultural society. Allow me to present a few pieces of evidence from the Narnian books. First, the various Narnian peoples did not live together. They had their own separate communities. Fawns didn't live with talking mice. Dwarves lived in their own dwarfish societies. Marshwiggles dwelt in wigwams in their own marshy northern territory. This is significant. Such separation would doubtless be labeled as segregation or apartheid by multiculturalists today. Second, the various tribes continued throughout Narnian history to be identifiable as distinct peoples. This distinction sometimes even pierced to the level of dividing one tribe into smaller tribes. Nicobrick and Trumpkin are not just dwarfs, but a black dwarf and a red dwarf, respectively. Third, each tribe had its own customs and cultures. After Nicobrick is killed in his attempted overthrow of Caspian, Peter orders this, the dwarf we will give to his people to be buried in their own fashion. To his people, which here means not Narnians, nor yet dwarfs, but black dwarfs. And to be buried in their own fashion. That is, according to black dwarf cultural burial customs, not some broader Narnian customs. So each Narnian tribe or ethnicity had its own culture. Yet they were all Narnians. As such, they came together for matters of national interest. The Council of War on Dancing Lawn in Prince Caspian is one such example. Now, these tribes did live in somewhat of a state of proximity to one another, as we see in The Horse and His Boy. A hedgehog calls out, Hello, neighbor, to a rabbit. We then see that this neighborhood also consists of squirrels, magpies, fawns, and mice. All are grouped under what Lewis calls the smaller woodland people. This is not strange, however. Woodland animals do live in proximity to one another, and so Lewis is simply showing here that these are true beasts. But interestingly, when a stag and red dwarf, Lewis capitalizes the name, show up, Lewis notes that they, quote, arrived in the wood, giving the sense that they were not part of the neighborhood of smaller woodland people. So there is a distinction, perhaps akin to the various ethnic Catholic neighborhoods of Irish, Germans, Poles, etc., in early 20th century American cities. Still, they are living rather close together, so close that the Red Dwarf refers to the little assembly as neighbors, yet far enough apart that it is a long walk to the dwarf's house. There is a sense that each tribe has its own place and culture. The dwarf lives with his two brothers, not with any of the animals. And they eat a different breakfast than the other creatures, of course, even with, quote, dwarf cups and plates and knives and forks. Again, the cultural distinctness remains, which cannot happen in a modern multicultural society. Clearest of all, in Prince Caspian, when Caspian and his new Narnian friends, a badger, a red dwarf, and a black dwarf, 
set out to call the people that lived in hiding to a Narnian council of war, they visit each tribe or people in its own community. Which, again, while they are in somewhat close proximity to each other, nevertheless are also separate, as this series of quotes demonstrates. We will go first to the three bulgy bears. They came in a glade to an old hollow oak tree covered with moss. After that they went on till they came among tall beech trees. Bounding down from branch to branch until he was just above their heads came the most magnificent red squirrel. Their next visit was to the seven brothers of Shuddering Wood. Trumpkin led the way back to the saddle and then down eastward on the northern slope of the mountains till they came to a very solemn place among rocks and fir trees. The seven brothers, who were all red dwarfs, promised to come to the feast at Dancing Log. A little farther on, in a dry rocky ravine, they reached the cave of five black dwarfs. As they came lower down, the mountains opened out into a great glen or wooded forge with a swift river running at the bottom. There came in sight the noblest creatures that Caspian had yet seen, the great centaur Glenstorm and his three sons. They found themselves in level fields, warm between hedgerows. There Truffle Hunter called at the mouth of a little hole in a green bank, and out popped the last thing Caspian expected, a talking mouse. There are twelve of us, sire. Now, do notice the words of Reepy Cheep, chief of the talking mice, a designation Lewis also capitalizes. I place all the resources of my people unreservedly at your majesty's disposal. By my people, he does not mean Narnians, but talking mice. Here we see the true nature of Narnian society, a nation made up of various ethnic peoples, all sharing a common national identity, but each with its own territory and culture, and each identified as a specific people. But of course, this kind of setup would be decried as segregation or apartheid by multiculturalists who insist that everyone must live together in the same communities, the same neighborhoods, even in the same families. Now, what unites the various Narnian tribes, of course, is their loyalty to and love for Aslan. Their national identity is, therefore, primarily religious, not unlike that of the Holy Roman Empire, uniting various Germanic territories under a common Christian banner but the Narnian smaller ethnic identities remain intact. Thus we may understand each Narnian ethnicity in terms of tribe. But because of the smallness of the land of Narnia, we also see another parallel, one I mentioned previously, that of the ethnic and religious neighborhoods in American cities 75 or 100 years ago. Each American in an important sense, but each with its own unique community and cultural and religious life. Thus, we may also understand each Narnian ethnicity in terms of neighborhood. So while these various Narnian tribes or neighborhoods are all loyal to the kings and queens of Narnia, they also govern their own tribes locally and are left alone by the crown to do so. But are they really left alone? Against my thesis, so it seems, we may set the example of Caspian crushing the slave trade in the Lone Islands in the voids of the Dawn Treader. Isn't that an example of the Narnian crown interfering with local culture? No, I think not. Clearly the people there were loyal to Narnia and were not happy under Gumpus, who was flagrantly breaking Narnian laws in a way that oppressed the people through man-stealing and slave trafficking with Narnia's international enemies, the Kalormans. Now we should point out that it is possible to make an evil thing of one's tribal or ethnic or national identity. The fate of those who cried out, the dwarfs are for the dwarfs in the last battle, should be enough of a warning in this regard. But their evil does not invalidate the love of Trumpkin for the Red Dwarfs, or Reepicheep for the Talking Mice. Now, it must be admitted that Narnia is a bit unusual in Lewis's fictional world that he's created here. The Arkenlanders and Lone Islanders all seem to be humans, and European humans at that, while Kalormans are all Arabic humans. Narnia alone, it seems, partakes of Aslan's threefold designation of walking trees, talking beasts, and divine waters. Nevertheless, it is the distinctness of the various Narnian peoples that refutes any attempt to define Narnia multiculturally. For multiculturalism today is not a mere tolerance of different cultures. 
Rather, it is an intentional smashing together of very different cultures, none of whom have the overarching religious unity that the Narnians had. The intention is to overrun the host cultures, always European, with non-European cultures so thoroughly that the host cultures will eventually no longer be European in any meaningful sense. That, by the way, is the stated intention of many multiculturalists. Multiculturalism demands that European cultures be absorbed into a new, hybridized multiculture that does not allow for distinct Western ethnic life to live and grow, separate from the main multiculture. Narnian tribes or neighborhoods, by contrast, remain distinct throughout many generations and thousands of years. It is at the very beginning, at Narnia's creation, that Aslan declares that threefold designation of Narnian peoples, walking trees, talking beasts, divine waters. And these distinctions perdure through the very end of Narnia itself. The various peoples of Narnia throughout their history remain distinct from each other, yet they share a national identity, separate, dare I say it, but equal. But this is not a forced segregation, it is a voluntary partition, just as their union in the Narnian Confederacy is also voluntary. Now there is one example in the Narnian stories that seems to be suggesting a multiculturalist theme, and so we should take a moment to examine it. In Prince Caspian, Caspian's dear tutor, Dr. Cornelius, describes his ancestry thus, I'm not a pure dwarf, I have human blood in me too. Many dwarfs escaped in the great battles and lived on, shaving their beards and wearing high-heeled shoes and pretending to be men. They have mixed with your tell marines. I am one of those, only a half-dwarf. Now what are we to make of this, especially in light of Dr. Cornelius' next words, in which he anticipates what might be called a kind of racism? And if any of my kindred, the true dwarfs, are still alive anywhere in the world, Doubtless they would despise me and call me a traitor. This would seem to be an anti-racist or multiculturalist theme on Lewis's part, especially since he later writes the following exchange for Nicobrick, who turns out to be an evil traitor, and Trumpkin, one of the best and noblest Narnian characters. Pa, said Nicobrick, a renegade dwarf, a half and halfer, shall I pass my sword through its throat? Be quiet, Nicobrick, said Trumpkin. The creature can't help its ancestry. Nicobrick later says, And it's all mixed up with that tutor, a renegade dwarf. I hate him. I hate him worse than the humans. You mark my words, no good will come of it. So is this multiculturalist or anti-racist theme on the part of Lewis? There are a few points to be made here. First, it is true that none of us can help our ancestry, and that hatred of people on the basis of such things amounts to a despising of the handiwork of God and our fellow men. We must not do so. But second, Nicobrick's hatred for the half-and-halfers is clearly not based on race. Certainly not on racially affected appearance at any rate, for Nicobrick hates them worse than the humans, who look far less like true dwarfs than do the mixed dwarfs. So not a race-based hatred, but a hatred grounded in the fact that the half and halfers are the result of union with the hated Telmarines, who conquered Narnia and dispossessed the Narnians. Third, if this is a multiculturalist theme on Lewis's part, he has a funny way of showing it. He has Cornelius observe a difference between himself and the non-mixed dwarfs, which he calls, as we saw earlier, the true dwarfs. Nevertheless, Cornelius identifies with them, calling them my kindred, not with his Telmarine ancestors. Here's what he says. But never in all these years have we forgotten our own people and all the other happy creatures of Narnia and the long-lost days of freedom. Notice first that he makes a distinction between our own people and all the other creatures of Narnia. But also, we here must mean the half and halfers and our own people, the dwarfs. Cornelius, the child of a dwarf and a human, suffers a kind of identity crisis and chooses to identify with the dwarfish side of his heritage, perhaps as much for religious as for ethnic reasons. Cornelius the half-and-halfer is an example of something that might be construed as a kind of Narnian multiculturalist or anti-racist theme. But since the hatred described is not based on racial characteristics but on historical associations, and since Cornelius views his own mixed status as making him something less than a true dwarf, I think it is plain that Lewis has no multiculturalist theme in mind here. 
This is a hard fact to accept, but accept it we must if we value the truth. C.S. Lewis, like almost all past Christians, was indeed a racist. According to the current definition of racism, which defines all European people as inherently racist, and which identifies any desire for the preservation of Western civilization as racist. Racism these days is not about mistreating people because of their race or ethnicity. Christians do not believe in mistreating anyone, but that's not what the word means anymore. And so when I say things like, there is no racial basis for Nickabrick's hatred, I am not trying to defend Lewis against charges of racism. Rather, I'm trying to defend him from his confused defenders, who embracing a pipe dream of making Lewis acceptable to the spirit of the age, want him to be a paragon of multiculturalism. To put it more strongly, I am assuming that being a racist by the current definition is something of a badge of honor. And thus, I am actually trying to prove that Lewis was indeed, by that same definition, a racist, or as he might have put it, an old Western man, and that this is not a bad thing. In summary, Narnia is not an example of the multiculturalism being peddled by today's globalists and cultural Marxists. It is a free confederacy of diverse tribes who, despite their national Narnian identity, still retain their cultural and ethnic identities as unique peoples. Well, that's all for Episode 1 of the Christendom Curriculum Podcast. Thanks for joining us today. You can get a free, signed, and inscribed copy of my book, Talking of Dragons, the children's books of J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, which includes a chapter on Narnia, when you join the Christendom Curriculum. So visit us online at christendomcurriculum.com. Thanks for listening.